Thank you so much, Shay. All right, so again, welcome in everybody to our office hour. We're here today to talk with Paul Margulies on creating a cult, an organizational culture that promotes recovery and the implementation of psychiatric rehabilitation. So you all know me by now. I'm Daniela Labate Cavelli. I am joined today by Paul Margulies. We're one presenter short. Unfortunately, Edie's out sick today, so she won't be able to join us, but she's certainly here in spirit. Um, I just have a quick little couple of housekeeping things, and then I think we're going to go ahead and and jump into the material. That is our, our partner training slide. You're all aware of who's working with us um, on this training. And so we've got Paul Margulies with us today. He's back from last week and he's one of our, our faithful advisors on this group, um, on this training academy. And he's with us from CPI, the Center for Practice Innovations. Paul, do you wanna do a quick intro for yourself? Well, hello again, everybody. I think we probably connected last week or so. Uh, yeah. As Daniela says, I'm Paul. I'm from the uh, Center for Practice Innovations. I'm a psychologist and I've been providing psych rehab and training in psych rehab for about 40 years. And I'm just delighted to be here with you today. Awesome. And Paul, like I said, Paul is an integral part of our team here putting this training together. So we're grateful for that, Paul, as is Edie, actually. All right. So uh, before we get into the summary of the webinar, real quick, we are recording today's webinar. We are not doing continuing education credits for our office hours, but please do remember to fill out that evaluation. We'll put a link in the chat box at the end so you can have instant access to it. We also will be sending out the link tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, in your in inboxes. So pay attention for that. You'll have the link to today's recording as well as the link to the evaluation in that email. I also wanna let people know that the podcast went up in the last couple of days. I believe it was uh, Monday or Tuesday it went up. So if you haven't listened to the podcast yet, please take a listen. It's about 25 minutes long, something between 20 and 25 minutes long. Um, really great examples you'll hear in the podcast of culture and culture change. And it kind of really solidifies um, what we talked about last week in the webinar. So I want to encourage you to listen to that. And you can do that through either Spotify or through our website and our YouTube channel. Um, but with that, I think, oh, before we turn it over to you, Paul, for the summary, I want to just remind folks, we're going to do Slido's again. So keep your phones nearby so that you can scan the QR code and participate in the Slido's. All right. So Paul, you want to give us a quick summary of the webinar and then we'll get okay, into it. Okay then. So we're going to uh, do a quick summary and then we've got some questions for you. Hopefully you have some questions for us and we want to spend the office hours just clarifying and helping you continue to learn this material. So you may remember those of us who, those of you who were with us last week who have seen the recorded you know, webinar that we began by looking at the work of somebody called Harry Woodward. And Harry Woodward looked at organizations and, and how they develop and change over time. And he did this almost a generation ago now. And he looked at Fortune 500 companies, but what we talked about last week uh, was that uh, what he found in these companies a generation ago isn't a whole lot different from what happens in our agencies and organizations today. And so there are lessons to be learned here. I guess there is a keyword, which is orange. So what Harry Woodward found is that there are three kinds of changes in organizations. There's evolutionary change, which is gradual, it's incremental. You can plan for it, prepare for it, and it kind of, you know, it, it happens over time. It evolves. There's also strategic change. You feel a sense of control that you're driving it, or at the very least, keeping pace with it. And then there's shock change. And as I recall, when we were talking with you all last week, shock change is something that people experience a fair amount. It's unexpected, it's often unwelcome. It catches you off guard, it sets you back, maybe it moves you forward, maybe both. And the major observation uh, that Woodward made, looking at all these different companies, was that oftentimes leadership believes that they are engaged in strategic change, sitting in the boardrooms and putting together game plans and, and implementation plans and timelines. But many folks who are providing the services or doing the work experience it as shock change. And when that occurs, it's a real problem. 
because if people are experiencing it as shock, it can set them back and they won't be able to really be fully on board. So that's something that managers, that leaders really need to keep in mind. He also found that organizations have life cycles. There's a growth curve and they follow a pretty, pretty predictable trajectory. They start in what's known as the formative phase. This is like being at a startup, if you've ever been at a startup. And the job here is to invent yourself and figure out how you're gonna provide the services or create the product, just starting out. And then there's the normative phase. And this happens once the organization has found its way. There's high pr productivity or profitability. There's a successful pattern that gets repeated over and over again. And what he found was, you know, in many organizations, people want and believe that the normative phases are gonna continue forever but it doesn't. And it doesn't because the conditions around us change over time. So whatever was going on that supported the normative phase, things change and now the organization moves into what is known as the integrative or transformational phase, which means it's got to kind of reinvent itself. Things get uncertain and the organization needs to find a new way of being. One of his observations, and this goes back decades ago, but I think uh, we agreed last time that it's still true today, is that for many organizations, for many agencies, they're in this permanent transformational phase. Things don't settle down. There's constant change going on and constant need to adjust and readjust. And that's very important for us to keep in mind, you know, that, that you know, Things don't settle down into a pattern necessarily for a long period of time because more changes are occurring outside that are forcing us to change. So when this happens, what's the effect it has upon the people who work in the organization and your agency? People feel that they tend to lose a sense of control over their work life, their status within the organization, and the meaning that they derive from their work. So if I was hired in your agency to do a certain kind of, say, psychotherapy, and the agency is moving on to another model, I'm losing control over how I spend my day. I may have lost status or feel I'm losing status because I was viewed as the expert in that particular psychotherapy, and we don't do it anymore or don't do much of it, so I'm losing some status. And the meaning in my work, because I really, really value doing that kind of therapy, might also be challenged. And when people feel that they're losing control, status, and personal meaning, it sets them back and it makes it difficult for them to engage in the new changes. And when things go well in an organization, as it makes these transformations, as it makes these transitions, the staff, the people working in the agency, the, their, their desire for control and for status and personal meaning are addressed by leadership and the supervisors. This stuff isn't ignored, but it's paid attention to. So organizations that have staff that handle all this very well, what are the qualities? There's an openness, there's support that's provided, there's really solid communication, and experimentation and comfort with experimentation. Then we talked about the three C's, culture, commitment, and capacity. And your agency or your program's culture has to do with your values and your rules. Your ability to commit has to do with your belief and the staff belief and leadership's belief that the changes are going to be positive and possible. It's really doable. And your capacity is that you have the knowledge and the attitude and the skills to make it happen. All three of these need to line up in order for innovation to be successful. So let's drill down a little bit. So here are some tips for encouraging the culture part of it, culture change. And the tips are to follow a clear recovery-based mission support only services that are consistent with that mission, 
to assure that people in recovery and with a lived experience are included in all the planning and policy development, to stress outcomes over process, looking at quality of life and recovery-oriented outcomes, to participate in the training, you need to understand new perspectives. Hopefully this is part of that. And to identify obstacles to change and to address those obstacles. So that's all about changing the culture. Another key word, and it is yellow. And how do you encourage commitment to change? It's about strong teamwork. It's about positive relationships. It's developing policies and following them and procedures, policies, procedures, new regulations that encourage and incentivize, in this case, psych rehab and recovery-oriented practice. To have a team, a transformation team, an innovation team that includes people in recovery in all of it to be clear about your objectives and goals, to participate in training in the philosophy of recovery and self-direction and self-determination, and to give tools to help people with their practice, and to support only those services that are consistent with this mission and vision. And then we have tips to encourage the capacity. Tools are really important here. And, and, and through this initiative, there are a lot of tools that are going to be made available to you. Supervision is important. So to create supervisory structures that teach and reflect and promote psych rehab practice. And once again, in this initiative, you know, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time with those supervisors that choose to join us. Understanding expectations and, and your job descriptions. Have evaluations that actually measure the knowledge and performance of psych rehab and recovery oriented practice. Get people trained in psych rehab and participate in supervision that addresses and allows for effective staff self disclosure. That one's important. That in order to learn, you really need to have to be comfortable and feel you're in a safe space to talk about your experiences as you're learning. And then finally, we spoke a little bit last week about. The role of leadership in organizational change and the work of, of John Cotter. And just very quickly, he outlined eight steps that leadership can follow in order to help make innovation, help make change happen in their organization. And hopefully, for the sites that are implementing psych rehab through this initiative, this is going to happen. So, creating a sense of urgency, meaning making it important building a team to help guide it, making sure the vision is clear and everybody understands it, you communicate about it. Remove things that get in the way, the obstacles. Create short-term wins, which means, you know, you take it one step at a time and first you tackle the stuff that's not so hard to do. And then as you accomplish that, other things become easier to do. You maintain momentum and don't let up because no implementation project ever goes smoothly. And so if you have bumps on the road, it means you're on the right road, not on the wrong road, seriously. And then you do things to make the changes stick. So those were the eight steps. But what if you're not a supervisor or a leader? What can you do? You can step up and be active and vocal with your fellow team members. Some people call that being a champion. You can actively participate in all training and support activities. You can develop and fine tune your skills by using them in your work. You can be open and honest with your supervisor. Once again, creating a safe space where you can really talk about the work and learn from your supervisor, but you can't do that unless you're being honest and open. You can maintain your commitment to change in your work despite the inevitable obstacles that are going to be in your way. And, and probably most importantly, you can celebrate your growth. Okay, so we are going to do a Slido question. And as you can see, 
The question is, what word or phrase would you use to describe how you feel about your agency or your program placing an emphasis on psych rehab values and practices? Take a minute or two. Let's see what and, you think. And I saw that you just raised your hand. We're on a webinar platform, so unfortunately we can't unmute you, but you can communicate it with us through the chat box. How do you feel about your agency or program? And as you know, uh, the, the, the bigger the word, the more people are endorsing it. There's a lot of hope out there, Paul. Look at this. Hopeful, I love it. supported, excited. Look at this. But not, you know, not totally positive. There's bitter, there's super saddened, disheartened. And I, I would suspect these might be folks who are feeling the meaning in their work might be threatened right now. And we have words coming in through the chat box too. We have committed, encouraged, caring, creative. I love that. Inspired, so, concerned. Enthusiastic in the chat yes. box too. Yeah. We'll give people another minute or so. I see people still typing up. We want to hear from you. Please make your vote. But you can see there's a wide range here. There's some folks feeling unsupported. And hopefully, you know, as we begin to work with your agencies, you know, more specifically, that can change. Did you see the one that just popped up on my screen? It said hopeful but cautious. Ah. It's a good one. <clears throat> so to summarize what we're seeing here, the three, the four biggest words are hopeful, optimistic, supported, and committed. And that's wonderful. But we also have to acknowledge that there are some folks who are feeling unsupported or angry or bitter, I see here, or confused. And our hope is that over time, as we work directly with your programs or agencies, that can change. But we need to acknowledge that that's where some folks are at. And it's very consistent with what Harry Woodward found, isn't it? That when at times of change, people have all sorts of feelings. Okay. Shay, would you be able to please move along through the slide? Are you able to advance us? Okay, the next one is what benefits will participants in your agency or program experience as you more fully embrace psych rehab values and, and practices? So this is for your participants. What are the benefits? Give folks another minute or two. Plenty more opportunity to respond, folks. Wow, this is a great one. So the, the, the conclusion that I'm kind of reaching here, Daniela, is that even though we're pretty early in this initiative, people are really seeing the connection between uh, implementing psych rehab and the impact it could have on people. You read my mind, Paul. When those words started popping up on the screen, I said, wow, they get this. <laughs> we yeah. all get this. Yeah. People are seeing it. Yeah. And that's a wonderful thing. 
and and what's on the screen is consistent with what's in the chat box as well so thanks oh, to the folks that that chatted in the chat box yeah great looks like oh looks like one other person is still typing but it looks like we're kind of slowing down mm -hmm. i love this empowered confident achievement success this is yeah. great it's great people get it this is wonderful yeah well okay thank you for that folks we can move along uh Shay, if you can please just move along to the next slide for us green is your keyword And then for some reason, I can't advance the slide now. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is office hours. So although we have other Slido questions and some chat box questions that we may get to in a little while, we wanted to pause here and give you all an opportunity to ask questions related to the material. And, and, and Daniela and I will do our best to, to respond. So let's take a few minutes, really as many minutes as we need and see if we can address, address whatever your questions are. So, so Paul, I'm not sure if you saw, but there was a question that popped up in the chat box before the Slidos. Um, and oh, I, no. took, I took note of it for you. Okay, let's hear. So it says this, this is from Anthony. Anthony says, um, as we are all leaders and advocates in one way or another, can you speak to the phenomenon of the seeming deafness of higher levels to those in their agency who are telling about red flags or areas where change is needed. If people on our levels bring the needs to them, even if it's done intelligently, respectfully, and with workable solutions offered versus their hearing from consultants and people like you or other people that are higher up, <clears throat> such as OMH, um, as you know, managing up can be really challenging. So what kind of uh, advice do you have there? Wow. So the first the big thing, question. <laughs> yeah. And the first thing is to recognize that's a tough spot to be in, right? It's a tough place to be. It's very difficult if you're excited about something and the folks, you know, who have, uh, who are above you in the organization and who have some control over things you don't, don't quite see it the same way or aren't hearing you or aren't giving you the opportunity. So that's just a really tough place to be. Uh, so, I mean, uh, my my reaction is, first thing is I wouldn't let up. I would continue, you know, to find ways to raise these important issues. Uh, I think that if your agency is gonna be working with us closely around implementation, you know, we can be helpful around that as well, I think, uh, because we'll bring in another perspective on all that. But, you know, my, my, my general reaction is it's a tough place to be. I know I've worked in settings where, you know, uh, leadership wasn't hearing uh, some of the challenges that were in front of me as I tried to implement something, and I know how difficult that can be. And sometimes, despite that lack of uh, support from leadership, I was still able to pull it off, and sometimes I was compromised and couldn't. Danielle, I don't know if there's anything you would add to that. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's an interesting phenomenon because, you know, there are, you know, all sorts of players when we come, you know, when we talk about change, right? And there's all sorts of players in in the roles of change. and and i I think you'll find, you know, even you know, if you're a practitioner or a supervisor or an administrator, whatever your role is at the agency you're working in, we all actually experience, I think, from time to time, the same discomfort with change. We may not always talk to each other about it, but we've all been there. And we can identify with it. So I think, you know, keeping that in mind too, you know, just because, you know, you may feel like you're not being heard. It may be that your supervisor feels similarly and can't share that with you. You know, I've been in situations I know, you know, in, in previous jobs, you know, we've all been in situations in my lifetime where I felt like I could identify with someone, but I couldn't tell them that I could identify with them too. So be mindful of that too, because everybody's sort of on their own change journey here, you know? Yeah, that, that resonates with me. You know, the other thing I would add is there's authority and there's influence in an organization, and they're not the same thing, but they're both very important. 
And sometimes, you know, if you're in a leadership or a supervisory role, you have authority and you can literally make, tell people what to do or, or make things happen, not to say that's necessarily the best management style. Uh, but sometimes you may not have official formal authority, but you have a lot of influence because of the work, the good work that you do and the respect that, you know, you, people have in you and that sort of thing. And I wouldn't underestimate the power of influence. And sometimes it's not obvious immediately, but over time it makes a difference. Uh, all the more reason why don't give up, please you know, express yourself, make it very clear what you're saying. Uh, yeah, the other thing, and once again, I don't know the details of this particular situation, of course, but you know, generally my rule of thumb is if I'm identifying obstacles and things, I also like to identify facilitators. So I like to point out the good as well as the not so good. And sometimes that gets me uh, uh, more receptivity. People are more likely to listen, you know, when I'm also pointing out what's going well. Uh, so that's something to consider as well. Good point. So we're looking for other questions in the chat box. Yeah, I don't see any quite yet. Any. any questions? Anybody have any questions about sort of the the stages of change that we talked about, or the implementation? The you know the the sort of uh, tips around implementation that Paul mentioned. We could always come back to the chat. Yeah, we can do that. So maybe we can move up. Here's a question. Here's a question. Can you discuss if possible how we as rehab practitioners can increase rehab versus treatment models? I feel inpatient facilities struggle with this. I think we all struggle with this. We all struggle with this, don't we? And, and one way of looking at it is I, I've tried over the years not to view it as one versus the other, but as both can complement one another, you know, uh, uh, because they do. Uh, and there is room in most of our lives for both a rehab perspective around, you know, life roles and, 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 and that sort of thing, as well as a treatment perspective for, for people who, are uncomfortable with their symptoms and would like to have those addressed. Uh, for some people, that's also important. So, you know, I, I try hard not to view it as one or the other, but as, you know, complementary. Uh, I think also, just to chime in, Paul, I think mm -hmm. also, you know, helping people become aware of psych rehab, I think is really important. Um, and, and helping people become aware of options, right? We talk a lot about this actually in the in the first learning module that you're gonna have access to very shortly, right? Um, and part of what we talk about is, you know, this is the process of psych rehab, really educating people around like, what's the process of psych rehab? And I think if people become more exposed to psych rehab or as more of our participants become exposed to psych rehab, they'll start asking for it, which will be incredible. Yeah. Yeah. We had another question come in um, the chat box, Paul. It was uh, maybe we could have more discussion about obstacles to change. Yeah. And there are many, aren't there? There could be many obstacles. Yeah. And in a way, you can look at this a lot of different ways. But some of it, you know, one way of looking at it is similar to kind of uh, the psych rehab readiness process. Mm -hmm but for an organization, you know? Because it's very hard for an organization to commit to making changes if people in the organization don't view the changes as possible and positive. Yeah, it's a very hard thing to do. And the way to address that is to begin to make some small changes and see that indeed they are possible and it can be positive. Well, isn't that very parallel to psych rehab process yeah. too, Paul? Wow. <laughs> Right? I mean, because it, it's a very helpful way to look at this. It, it really is. Uh, you know, another part of it, and let's go back to some of what Harry Woodward was saying, is as we make changes, 
there can be some discomfort for us, right? And we need to accept the fact that it could be uncomfortable and be okay with that. And so if I came into the organization, into the agency, when we did things a certain way and I do it very well and, uh, and every day my bosses can count on the fact that I'm gonna do it very well, you know, and now you want me to make some changes and you want me to think in a different way, you know, that can be a little uncomfortable and, and that's okay. That's not a sign anything's wrong at all. Uh, yeah. I mean, we can probably identify many, many obstacles. And I think over the course of the next year or two or three, we're going to hear about a lot of them and we're going to do a lot of problem solving together, you know, around how to, how to deal with them. That could be a, a slide in and of itself, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was Leela saying, are you aware of Woodward's opinion that these observations, these made in organizations can be made in the individual? You know, uh, I don't know that he explicitly went there, but I think we can, we can say there's a lot in common here, isn't there? Now, we did look at the impact on individual staff members and supervisors, right? And what he found was, you know, people can get uncomfortable and, and people can you know, feel threatened because they're losing the control and the status and the personal meaning at all. So the, the short answer is, yeah. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense, uh, a lot of sense. So Kathy gave us a, a story of encouragement in the chat box, which I love. Um, she says, creating a sense of urgency within an agency is difficult, but if addressed in an organized and mission-focused way, the remaining steps can be worked through successfully. Uh, Kathy was part of Cotter's approach in the large community agency, and while it took a lot of time and a lot of buy-in, the results were well worth it. For me, the key is putting a strong, diverse team together, so that includes management, direct care staff, uh, the people that we support, funders, you know, all sorts of, a, a, I would say even like QI, finance, you know, these are folks that make decisions, right? Wow, I'd love to quote this. Kathy, yeah. thank you so much for sharing that. And then it looks like something else just popped in too. Let's see. Yeah. Here's a thought. Finding mechanisms for ongoing communication to various levels and various providers in our agency to communicate not only about what psych rehab is, but about our successes and how collaborating with other providers contributed to success stories. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, let's just stay with that for a moment because you, you, Anthony, you're making such an important point. I think people are influenced by two different kinds of things. Some people are influenced by data, right? The research says, and here's some data from the past year, and, and, and that's really important. Other people are influenced by stories, by narratives, by real life examples, you know? And, and I think when we're communicating, both of those become very, very important. You know, uh, both of those can make a difference. One isn't more important than the other. They're both really, really important. And so as you begin your psych rehab implementation and people begin to achieve their life goals, to be able to talk about that, for them to be able to talk about that if they're comfortable doing that and sharing you know, what they're accomplishing, that is like so powerful. And for those kinds of discussions to be held with, you know, everybody at every level of the organization from the executive leadership on, very, very powerful. So yeah, great thought, Anthony. Looks like the chat box may be slowing down. Should we go to, I think we have another question though, right? Okay. For, for our audience. Oh yeah, we've got a bunch more. So this is another slide up. What phrase describes a supervisor or manager who has helped your agency or program successfully deal with innovative change, which may or may not be psych rehab because many of you are just starting out with psych rehab, but maybe there are other innovations. So if people can do the Slido thing or type up in the, in the chat box, that's okay too.
this is such a great technology because it really just captures the power of ideas. Encouraging, empowering, understanding, open, creative, supportive. Yeah, that's exactly what's in the chat box. We have a lot of open, we have progressive in the chat box too. Progressive, supportive, open, visionary, listener, hope. Good stuff. Passionate. I like that. We have to have passion to do this work, I think. Yeah. I think we all have passion to do this work. And and the underlying message here, because people are speaking about supervisors or managers, you know, <clears throat> really helped with innovation. The underlying message is innovation can really happen in our in our agencies. It really does happen. It can happen. You know, on the podcast for people who, who haven't heard it yet, you know, Paula Fries was able to talk about in her agency how innovations happened over the course of, of, of you know, a couple of decades, really. Yeah. It's doable. And it happened quite a few times, right? Yeah. As conditions changed. That's right. This is wonderful, folks. Thank you very much. I think you got it. Shay, if we can move on, if you're able to advance that slide. Okay, now we have a chat box question. So this is a personal question. What will you do to help your agency or program's leadership to implement psych rehab? We all have a role here. What will you do? What can you take on? What are you comfortable taking on? What are you able to take on? Now let's see what ideas have, people have. So please type it up in the chat box. Practice it, teach it. Have my entire team take this training. I love that, Brandy. Sharing what I learned here with the full team. Educate, share what I learn. Stay engaged. Try and be flexible. Model it. Use the language. Thank you, Anne. Encouraging. Start the conversation. I'm going to participate in the plan. Be the champion. I can't. There's also a lot of share what I learn. So yes. for folks that aren't able to participate alongside with you, share your share what you learn. Absolutely. Yes. This issue of being a champion is so important. Champions aren't, you know, the, the, the champions aren't necessarily the leadership of the agency or even of your program. Champions are people who feel with passion, you know, uh, the importance and understand it. And that can be communicated and respected regardless of where we are and who we are. I mean, that's such an important role. And people are saying model it, right? Just do it. Do it and people will jump alongside you. A lot of emphasis here on talking with team members mm -hmm. and being involved in the chain in, in, in these trainings and being an example, model. This is an interesting one from Amber. Work with the Edin training department to, to, to develop a training or workshop. So that's going mm -hmm. above and beyond, adding to what we're making available. I think that's a great idea. Take this training with the team and share with others. Now, one of the nice things about the way in which this is set up, the academy, is all this training is on the website. That's right. So you can do that. So if somebody wasn't with us this week or last week, or they're joining three months into the process, this stuff's all out there. It's there for you. Yeah. And you know, Paul, what I've been hearing from some providers is that they actually, um, if they can't watch together live, they'll watch the recordings together. Like they'll put all the staff in a room in a staff meeting, watch the recording, whether it's live or, or pre-recorded, and then 
sit and talk through what the content is. They'll email us questions. I mean, there are some really cool things happening around New York State with this training. That's a really, that's a really great thing. Yeah. Modeling, sharing. Here's one, Heather saying, show data analysis about how beneficial it can be. So yes. that's, that's, that's what we were saying before. That's one of the two ways to communicate about this. Mm -hmm. Supportive model, a lot of modeling. Communicate changes with staff early to avoid shock. That's Dean. That's a great one. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, now I think we have some more questions. How will you feel when your agency or program makes the kinds of changes supported by this initiative? So you're a year away from now, you know, it's 2024. The training happened, stuff gets implemented, you're working with the uh, recipients. How are you gonna feel? If you're gonna type it up in the chat box, please. See, people have begun to do that already. Accomplished, good, thrilled, safe, satisfied, hopeful, amazing, excited, motivated, all good. Renewed passion, we all can use that sometimes, right? Yeah, empowered. Have hope. Yes, Anne, I'm with you. Wow. How many times are people saying empowered? I wish this is great. I know we should count it up. <laughs> you know, but so what's very interesting about this, and, you know, we keep talking about this parallel process, right, Daniela, that like you read my mind. <laughs> I bet. Well, we've been working together long enough, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, Psych Rehab is all about empowering recipients. But in the process, practitioners are feeling empowered. Right. I think I, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, Paul, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that when you all get through this training you'll have a renewed sense of like why you do this work. You're going to feel just as good about doing the work as you did when you first started to do the work. Um, and you're going to, you're going to feel that energy alongside the folks that we support. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Validation, hope, accomplished. This is great. Effective. I love that. Yes. Effective. Yeah. This is great. Equipped with what works, authentic. Very cool. Equipped, yep. I'll tell you, I remember my first day on my first job in a day treatment program, I felt everything but equipped. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't even want to go back. Those memories, those memories are, are good I mean, ones. I know I'm dating myself by the words day treatment program, but, you know, we were, I was not equipped. <laughs> So I can identify with that. <laughs> oh, yes. And then I remember the first group I ran, never knowing how to run a group. That's correct. I, I was told, go do this group in this room. I said, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, exactly. Thankfully, the, the field has moved forward a bit more. and We've progressed a little bit, I think. So, <laughs> since then. Well, yeah, because we, 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 you know, we have an evidence base now, you know, That's there's right. good research. We've got in psych rehab, you know, decades of this work from around the world, really, now. That's right. And, and we know it works and we've witnessed that it works. And so if you want to look at the data side of things, or if you want to look at the story narrative side of things, both support the idea that this is good stuff. see what else we have here. More people are commenting. Oh, there's a question real quick. Just there's a question from Heidi uh, with this work being needed all over the country. Is this training only for New York? So there is like rehab training. And as a matter of fact, PRA, 
the body that certifies psych rehab practitioners works around the country, right? Um, our training academy is specific to New York because that's where our funding came from, right? It came from New York State OMH for, you know, our psych rehab providers. So, um, but there's certainly training all over the country and the world, like Paul said. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, I would, I, I think it probably happened in Europe before it happened here, right? Like in back in the days of, uh, I know there was some, some training in Italy, I want to say, in like Trieste a gazillion years ago, right? Like in the 70s or something? You know, I think, what, and I think what yeah. they found is, you know, you know, regardless of where, the principles make sense and, uh, right. and, and the practices make sense. One of like the first longitudinal studies on like rehab, right? Yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah. it really, it really, yeah. And we've been doing this on and off in New York State for a very long time, but it really was time for a renewal to really push this agenda out again. So this is great. Anthony, I, I am with you. I totally agree with you. He I said he said he thinks for a we're... whole new phase of growth in this field. Yeah. And that's that's truly one of the visions for this project. So yeah, thank you for stating that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Heather says client stories are the data. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and David, David agrees. Yep. I think we all agree with that one. Yeah. Good stuff. So let's see if there's another question. I can't recall now. No. no. So why don't we throw it back open again? If you all have questions, please type them up in the chat box. We have a few minutes. We yeah, we have about 10 minutes, minutes left. Right. Yeah. Um, I also just want to reiterate, there were some questions around evaluations earlier on. Um, I'm not sure if folks saw the answer to that. So if people are missing evaluations and you need links to them, you can just send um, us an email. You can get us, you know, either email me directly. You can email us through the website and ask for evaluations. We've sent them out in various uh, communications. So your supervisors might have them as well, um, but we're happy to send to send those along if you need them. Oh, here's a question in the chat for you from Malika. Malika wants to know, how do we keep the momentum going? That is the $64,000 <laughs> question, as they once said many years ago. Uh, because just to be clear, and this is such an important question, implementing something isn't the same thing as sustaining it. That's right. And if anything, implementing is easier than sustaining it, right? So what are the things we look for? You know, we, we look to make it a part of everyday business. So it's not just the project anymore, it's how we do stuff. So what does that mean? It shows up in our record keeping, it shows up in our policies and procedures, it shows up in new employee orientation, right? It shows up in, in workbooks and handouts and other things we use throughout the program. We make sure that when new staff come in, we train them. They get trained in psych rehab. That's critical because, you know, people come and go. And, and nowadays, there's been a lot of staff turnover in so many agencies. So, you know, it's not a special thing to get trained in psych rehab. It's the expected thing when somebody gets hired. And always seeking feedback from recipients and from practitioners and from everybody else around, how can we make this better? Always asking, how can we make it better? And that'll keep you fresh. A great question. Kirk is saying, hopefully that social work education will be receptive for psych rehab. We couldn't agree more. And there's nothing about psych rehab that is incompatible with being a social worker or a psychologist or a nurse or a mental health counselor or what have you, yeah. or a physician. Nothing incompatible. We couldn't agree more. Yeah, Antoinette saying, I feel my soul that implementing is not the same as sustaining. Yes, keep it going. You can so easily let your guard down and, and, and have things slip back to where they were. And it's work, right, Paul? I mean, it's work to keep it going. It's a lot of it work. It takes effort, yeah. 
Yeah. It's about culture change, right? It's about changing yeah. the culture of your program or your agency. I think about it like, like everybody goes on a diet in the new year and starts going to the gym in the new year. But then by March, nobody's like going ever again for the rest of the year because it takes a lot of work, right? Yeah. But exactly if you have a buddy right. who's doing it with you, you're That's a little exactly more right. likely to keep that change going. So I always like when I talk about change, I, I, I make that analogy because if you've got like one person to support you at your agency, then it's a little easier. And then if you've got another person, it gets a little more easier, right? So building that team is really important. You know, one other aspect about uh, sustaining, about keeping it going, I believe that what you're going to find is that the recipients of psych rehab, the folks in your program, are going to see the benefit of it. They're going to like it. It's going to help them get what they want to do, what they want to accomplish, and that when that happens, there's a constant pressure and desire to keep it going because people recognize how good it is. Mm. So it's not just senior managers or leadership or your supervisors. It's your customers who are saying, we want the stuff. And that helps too. Other questions or comments? We have a couple of minutes left, a few minutes. Any other questions or comments? wonder if we could have some special office hours set up on an ongoing basis where we could share all our success stories with each other across the state. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, we're getting into this second phase of training, the modules and the in-person training. So I would hope that you feel like you can share some of those stories at our in-person trainings too. But after that, the third phase is really around like keeping it going, right, Paul? So we're going to do communities of practice. Yeah. Um, and that'll be something that will happen, you know, monthly. So you'll be able to certainly use the stories there. Um, and I think the other thing that we're doing, not I think, I know the other thing that we're doing is we're getting regional provider meetings going. So we've got one going in Hudson and Central, Western. We've got them all over. We've got forums all over the state. So come to those, share your stories there. Ah, when is the summer session schedule coming out? We, people want to know. Um, we are actually, we are 99.9% .9 complete. We're getting registration links now. I'm hoping that that um, all of the July training uh, schedule will go out early next week. That's my goal. Um, the June, there is no training in June, remember. June is going to be the learning modules. So we've been reaching out to providers now, making sure that people have access to their CPI or APS logins. Um, so please, if you see an email about a CPI or APS login, please don't ignore it because that's how you're going to have access to your training for June. Yes, we know we owe you one more keyword, don't we? I don't know. Let me let me move ahead. Let me think good. about this. Do I remember them all? <laughs> you know what? Mine isn't advancing. Shay, are you are you capable of advancing it? Please oh, leave. it was green. People are saying it was green. We have all three. Have okay. All three. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then somebody, so so just a reminder, because I saw there was a couple more questions in the chat about in-person trainings versus modules. So June is the first learning module. You'll do that on your own. It'll take about between two and a half to three hours to get through. And then the in-person trainings are throughout the month of July. There are going to be many to choose from. You only have to go to one three-hour training in your region. Okay. Daniela, anything else to share about what's what's coming? I think that's it. Like I said, please just keep an eye on your emails. We're going to announce the trainings. We're going to announce the registration is open. You'll register just like you do for everything else. You'll use the website to register. Um, if you need any information, feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to reach out to your consultant group, right? We have Steve in Western New York. We have Kirk down in New York City and Long Island. I've been covering the Hudson and Central regions, um, although we actually did just offer someone a position today. So we'll see how that turns out. <laughs> um, but I've been covering the, the Hudson and Central regions. So 
And what about setting up a community forum to post on? Well, that's an interesting question, Pat. Um, we might be able to do that on our website. That's something I actually could, I could check into that. That's a really great suggestion. Oh, I'll put my email in the chat. Although I feel like everybody knows my email by heart by now. Because <laughs> I bother you with emails all the time. <laughs> it's Daniela L at Niappers. So let us know if you need anything and we'll make that connection for you. And if not, we will be uh, hearing from you in June through the learning modules and we'll be seeing you in July when we're back out on the road with you. Looking forward to it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much okay. for joining us today. Take care, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye now. Bye-bye.